Hi, Pastor Gallagher here. Welcome to what we call the Victory Hour, which is a ministry of Clavel Assembly in Foster, Rhode Island. Clavel Assembly is a um, Calvinist oriented. We're not followers of John Calvin per se, we're followers of Jesus Christ. When I say Calvinist, I'm just referring to non infant baptism or anything like that. I'm referring to the overall portrait of the belief of the sovereignty of God. We believe in predestination. We believe in God's sovereignty. We believe that all that comes to pass has been ordered and ordained by God. So that's what I mean by Calvinist. So excuse the language if that offends you. But we are a Calvinist-oriented Christian ministry, followers of Jesus Christ. Uh, we are Bible believers, and we desire to preach the word of Christ, and we believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of a living God, and that salvation is by God's grace through faith in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Now, I want to get right to my lesson. And by the way, if you want to check us out further and see what's this guy up to and where is he coming from, our website is clavelassembly.com. Clavelassembly.com. And there's sermons there you can listen to and download and share with your friends for free. And many of them you can watch because they're live streams. So there's a video there. Some of the older sermons, they're not live streamed, but you can listen to them and share them. Take advantage of that. There's a short statement of faith of what we believe, which I covered in our uh, introduction to this YouTube channel. I, what was it? Four or six spots? I forget. But uh, that's all there. Check us out. If you want to email me, info at clavelassembly.com. Info at clavelassembly.com. And of course, you can write to me, The Victory Hour or Clavel Assembly, either one, The Victory Hour or Clavel Assembly, P.O. Box 222, Foster, Rhode Island, 02825. Be happy to hear from you. And we're glad that you're watching. Now listen, uh, so the last two programs that we posted on YouTube, I dealt with the subject of the current corruption of our own nation. There was a part one and a part two, the current corruption of our own nation. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't paint a pretty picture. But, you know, I didn't make that stuff up. And I, we, it's what's in front of us. We are going through a globalist, fascist, Marxist. Now, it's a combination of uh, fascism, globalism, Marxism, anti Christianity. And there are uh, and lawlessness. There's a, a degree of 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 um, um, atheism built into it, or quite a large degree, in my opinion. Anarchy, evil. It is overwhelming us. We, in my opinion, we don't have long to write this ship. We don't have long to write this ship. And so I did a two-part uh, presentation for you last week on the current corruption of our nation. And boy, that's just scratching the surface. Do huh. you want to talk about, we didn't even get into things like the Federal Reserve and that kind of thing. But that was enough to get the point across. We are going presently in 2022 through a revolution. And with the midterm elections coming up, um, that's going to make a big difference. By the way, I'm not a Republican. I'm certainly not a Marxist Democrat. But the most, as I said to you in, the, in one of the broadcasts last week, that most of the Republicans are rhinos, they're phonies, and they're enemies of the state as much as these Marxist leftists like Bernie Sanders and AOC and Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. You say, Pastor, you shouldn't be preaching politics. I'm not. I'm preaching morality. I'm preaching the idea that we as, crea as cre creatures of God's creation owe him our obedience. And what I mean is, we're to stand for what is good and honorable and decent and right and honest and fair and charitable and gracious. We're not doing that. We're pretending we're doing it. And we actually can deceive ourselves we're doing that when we're doing the opposite. That's how bad things are. So, I'm not giving you a part three as to the current corruption of our nation. I'm not going to do that. What I do want to do 
today and depending on time goes, maybe we'll continue it this Thursday. And then we'll shift gears into a more uh, theological area. I think I want to get into the area of, did you know that the Bible, the New Testament clearly teaches that Jesus would return in the first century before the termination of that whole generation ex, um, in, to, to whom he ministered. In other words, he would come back within the lifetime of the generation to which he ministered. That is, no, no. <laughs> I know the majority of Christians say, no, the Bible does not say that. It does say that, and there's no denying it. You say, well, then the Bible was wrong. The Bible was not wrong. I believe in the Bible. I believe the Bible is the inspired and errant word of God, and everything Jesus said was true. The establishment is pretending they do the same thing, but when it comes to eschatology, they are contradicting the scriptures, and they're contradicting Jesus. I will get into that subject. Not today, probably not Thursday, but we'll start that the following week. And I'm not, I can't go into that full ball, but we'll get into it probably for several recordings just to establish a simple principle. Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> and first, I've got to get you to recognize that establishment Christianity has a problem. They, uh, they declare being loyal to Christ, but they're not, and it can be proven everywhere. I'll show you that when we get to it. So we'll get into some doctrinal eschatological matters. All right, uh, eschatology, that's just the study of last things, of the, of, the, uh, of the second coming, the return of Christ, and the end of all things, that kind of thing. All right, but that's, that's for then. For now, I want to talk about, so the, those two previous recordings, we talked about the current corruption and revolution that our nation is going through. And if you didn't hear it, go back and listen to the last two, the current corruption uh, of of our nation, and it's shocking. But I don't think it should be news to you if you pay attention at all. I'm, I shouldn't be saying too much that you hadn't already understood. But when you start piling up and lay it all together, yeah, there's something going on. Yeah, and it's intentional. It's intentional. So what I want to do today, and probably Thursday, see how time goes. But what I want to do now is explain to you why this is happening. What is it that men are looking to achieve? Okay, you made the case of how bad it is, and yeah, we're going through a revolution, and we need to put a stop to it, absolutely. But philosophically, the question can come out into our minds, and we'll say, well, how can we be so bad? I'm not, there's many answers to that. I'm not going to address them all. I'm not going to address maybe some of the most important ones. I mean, the ultimate answer to that uh, question is because men are evil. Men are sinful. They are totally depraved in their natural state because they are fallen creatures. That includes all men. So ultimately, that's the answer. But I want to be, I want to go to another level with the answer. That's the broad answer, which is foundational. And it really does explain everything. But I want to be more specific. What is it that men specifically are looking to do? Why is this happening? Okay, so that's what I want to talk about today. Why our nation has entered into this phase of utter and total corruption? Well, I want to read to you from Deuteronomy chapter 17. Now, I did a sermon at Clavel. Um, I entitled it... Uh, where is this world heading, I think I called it. Where is this world heading? I don't know if the, the men out back gave it that title, but that was my title. What, wh where is this world heading? And um, I think something went a little weird with that sermon, because I would have just taken that sermon and posted it here on YouTube. Uh, but I want to give you kind of the nuts and bolts of it in, in a different way maybe than I presented it to the large people at Clave a little bit. But from the, from the viewpoint of what you've seen the last two postings here in this channel, um, <clears throat> where is this world heading? But I want to talk about why is it heading that way? What are we doing? 
So I want to start off by reading from Deuteronomy 17. Deuteronomy 17. And um, verse 14. When thou art come unto the land. Now this is Moses. This is Moses. And he's predicting what will happen to the nation of Israel under the old covenant. Okay? Not fake Israel, the Zionist state in the Middle East. That's not Israel. That's fake Israel. But the real one that existed in the days of Moses, right? To whom God had made a covenant. But Moses is prophesying. Verse 14, speaking to the nation, he says, When thou art come unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, and shalt possess it. So they hadn't gone in and taken the land yet when Moses is predicting this. And thou shalt possess it, and shalt dwell therein, and shalt say, I will set a king over me, like as all the nations that are about me. Now let me just stop there. That's verse 14. It's stopping in the middle of a sentence. But Moses is not here in verse 14 condoning that Israel in the future ask God to give them a human king so they can be like all the other nations. Moses is not condoning that by saying this. He's predicting it, but he's not condoning it. He's predicting their evil. He's predicting their rebellion against God. He isn't condoning this, this desire for a king. He's condemning it ultimately, as you will see as we go, okay? As you will see. He's re-prophesying, he's prophesying that they are going to make this rebellious request of God. Because before Israel had kings, they just had judges. And when they got into a jam and they needed deliverance, God would raise up a judge. A judge like even a guy like Samson. And they never really knew where their savior slash judge would come from. God would just raise him up in his sovereignty. But that would require that Israel um, continue to exercise faith day by day and just trust God to lead them through these means that they never really knew how he was going to do it. They just have to trust the Lord. Well, they got tired of trusting the Lord. And Moses is predicting they would get tired of trusting the Lord and they would ask God for a king. Now, he says, I'll set thee a king over me. This is what you will say in the future. You will, you will, you will, uh, thou shalt say, I will set a king over me, like as all the nations that are about me. And then Moses begins to, okay, you're going to do this thing. Well, when that does happen, let me give you some regulations you're going to need to follow. You're going to make a stupid request at least follow it through faithfully in obedience to God. And if you're going to do this dumb thing, here's the regulations you need to follow when you do this foolish thing. Well, that's what he's doing. Verse 15, the next, the next verse. Thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose. You have no right to choose the leader of God's nation. That's God's business. You choose out the one that God appoints. By the way, it's still the same thing in the local assembly. The, the modern church is not supposed to be governed by democracy. That's rebellion. It is an eldership that governs in the assembly. And pastor teachers are to be appointed by the sovereignty of God, not the will of the people. The elders must recognize where that appointment is, concur, and then make that appointment. And it's no different with the children of Israel. Uh, if they're going to have a king, they're going to set a king over them, they need to choose out the one that the Lord chooses for them. One from among thy brethren shalt thou set king over thee. No foreigners! Well. Let's just keep a lid on that for now. <laughs> thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother. It's understandable, right? 
You don't want anybody with dual loyalties governing over you. But he shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt. Nope. That king, once he's there, he's not to multiply horses to himself. He's not to have you go back to Egypt for salvation and dependence to the end that he should multiply horses. No, he doesn't go to Egypt to get horses. For as much as the Lord has said unto you, ye shall henceforth return no more that way to Egypt. Okay. Verse 17, neither shall he multiply, but speaking of the king, you put this king over you, all right, but that king shall, neither shall he multiply wives to himself. That is hot, turn not away. What's that mean? You got multiple wives? You don't want your, wi your wives stealing your heart and making the king over God's nation corrupt in his rule. Neither shall he multiply wives to himself, that is hot, turn not away. Neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold, money. But when you think about it, that's exactly what King Solomon did. He did all those things. He multiplied to himself silver and gold. He accrued to himself many horses. He multiplied horses and he multiplied wives that stole his heart. So after King Saul, who was a disaster in and of itself, and God showed you, see, you asked for a king, I gave you the kind that you deserve, Saul. And then God showed mercy and grace and gave them David who was a good king. He had his faults, right? He fell into sin, very grievous sin. But he had a heart after the Lord, and he sought to do right by the nation. But then David's son, Solomon, became king. So with a third king in. And Solomon did everything that a king is not supposed to do. And yet he was the wisest man in the face of the earth. So being wise does not make you moral. Having much knowledge does not make you moral. Your doctor may be a learned man, doesn't mean he's moral. Your dentist may be a learned man, doesn't mean he's moral. You know, I went to, uh, oh, what do you call it? Is it, uh, is it an endodontist? The guys that, you know, they, they, they do all root canals and stuff like that. I went to this specialist to have a root canal done. He goes and examines uh, the tooth. Okay, he goes, you know, the ne one next to it needs a root canal too. Well, I just came from my dentist. He said just the one. Oh, that one needs it too. You need to do a root canal on that tooth. I'll, I can do two root canals now. You know how much a root canal is? Okay, well, I've never told that by my dentist. He sent me here. He said this is the one. Well, you've got to have that done. You don't want to lose it. I said, well, I don't have the money to pay for two root canals and two caps on my teeth right all at once. So let's just do this one. He goes, I think I should do this root canal and let me do the other root canal. Save up some money and then you can do the cap. And I said, no. We'll do this one root canal and then a cap. I went back and told my dentist he said that. Well, he flipped his lid. Because once you do a root canal on a tooth, the tooth is dead. Once it's dead, it's brittle. That's why you put a cap over it. Because once it's dead and brittle, you could bite down on something and just smash that tooth. And now you can't even do a root canal. There's nothing. You're going to have to put an implant. For this guy to say, do two root canals and don't put caps on them, it's a, he knowingly was putting my teeth at risk. You don't do that. My dentist was ripping mad. And secondly, my other tooth didn't need a root canal. He lied to me. And that was, I don't know how long ago that was. Probably 18 years ago. Well, 18 years later, that tooth, that he never did, that needed it desperately. I still have and never had a root canal. And I don't have any problems with it. Liar he was. Okay? So Solomon can be the wisest man on the face of the earth. It doesn't mean his heart's in the right place at any given time just because he's that brilliant and has that much wisdom. Anyway. 
Here we are in Deuteronomy, <laughs> Deuteronomy 17 and verse 17. That king, neither shall he multiply wives to himself, that his hot turn not away, neither shall he multiply to himself silver and gold. Well, Solomon was doing all that. See? It was a problem. And there's more regulations. Verse 18. And this is Deuteronomy 17. It shall be when he, the king, sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom, that he will write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priests, the Levites. And it shall be with him. And he shall read therein all the days of his life, that it may learn the fear of the Lord his God, to keep all the words of this law and these statutes, to do them. He used to have a copy of the law of God and to study the law of God and to make sure as king he implements that which is God's will, not his own. And that's the essence of this whole text. He is to, to implement the will of God, not his own will. If you're going to have a king, you better be careful because he needs to do God's will, not his own. So he's to read this law and implement it. And we're told why in the next sentence. That is hot be not lifted up above his brethren, and that he turn not aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, to the end that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, <laughs> he and his children in the midst of Israel. You see what he's saying? This is so pertinent today. When you've got someone in whom there is much power, a ruler, in this case, Israel's king, that they will in the future ask for, that king he is, he is to study God's law and only do God's will. Why? That his heart be not lifted up above his brethren. Now, that's part of the problem with our leaders. They are filled with arrogance and pride. They are the ruling elite. We are peons. We can shut up. You know they don't care what we think. Otherwise, they'd shut the borders down. They don't. They don't care what you think. We, they know what we think. We want voter ID so we don't have people that are illegal voting, but they don't care. They say that's an attack on democracy. They know what the American people think, and they don't care. They are the ruling elite. They are ruling on behalf of the proletariat. Well, according to Vladimir Lenin, you need a dictatorship class to rule the proletariat. And guess who the dictatorship class is? Nancy Pelosi, Joe Biden. Kamala Harris, Chuck Schumer, is this a joke? I don't find it funny. They're coming for our throats. You'll own nothing and be happy, we're told. World Economic Forum, there's pure evil. This is what they're implementing. It's the Great Reset. So, you're going to have this king, he's got to follow, not his own will, because his will will lead him in a certain direction. See, this is why these things happen. He needs to study, read the law constantly and study it and realize he needs to implement it. That his heart be not lifted up above his brethren, like our own leaders, and that he turn not aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, like our own leaders have done. They've left morality and common sense and decency. Why? To the end that he may prolong his days in his kingdom. What? You see, they'll do every dirty trick to stab their own people in the back if it will enable them to stay in power. Does it sound familiar? Yeah, it's like Rhode Island politics, too. One of the most corrupt in the nation, in my opinion. It's all about staying in power. I know a guy. Oh, uh, yeah, it's the I know a guy state. And, and Rhode Island founded by Roger Williams. We've gone from Roger Williams to this. So these kings will lift their hearts up above their brethren. That's the natural trajectory. 
They'll turn aside from the commandments of God and that which is moral. They'll become amoral, like our leaders have. That he or they may prolong their days in their kingdom. Speaking of the king, that he may prolong his days in his kingdom. That's why he does these things. That he may prolong his days in his kingdom. He and his children in the midst of Israel. So he's going to take care of his own. He'll use the power of state to take care of his own. His own family, and like in Rhode Island, his own cronies. Well, like in Washington, D.C., they take care of their cronies. You're part of the swamp. You're part of the club. You won't get prosecuted. We're not seeing that? That's why these kind of things happen. Oh, I can see. Like, I'm a, I've only got five minutes left. Yeah, yeah this is going to continue into Thursday's uh, posting as well. So you, you tune in then. You want to hear more of this. Or maybe you don't want to hear more of this. It's a, no, it's a terrible, it's an ugly story. It's a, it's a horrible thing. But we got to face it. And as Christians, we're supposed to face it. Not be afraid of it and stick our head in the sand and say, oh, well, uh, I just want to make myself a tuna fish sandwich and have a picnic. Well, go ahead. Make a tuna fish sandwich and have a picnic, but have a sword to fight the evil that exists in our day and don't ignore it. In 1 Samuel, we've got to go to 1 Samuel. So Moses predicted they would ask for a king and it would go in a bad direction. And he wasn't wrong. I didn't read to you all that Moses predicted about it going in a bad direction. He has a whole chapter on it. <laughs> he prophesied it, and he prophesied accurately. But they ended up doing the very thing that they should not have done, that Moses predicted they would do, that would ultimately bring them to their demise, okay, in the end. But in 1 Samuel chapter 8, and verse 4 and 5, we read... <clears throat> Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel and, and unto Ramah and said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not after in thy way. Now Samuel was a, he was a good prophet. And thy sons, who are not good, walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. See, that's the thing Moses predicted they would do. We want to have a king like everyone else. We don't have to depend on... God to hopefully come up with some judge to help us. We want someone in place with a standing army. They wanted to be like everybody else. Then they wouldn't have to live by faith anymore. But that's a lot easier, in their opinion. Here they are asking for a king. Verse 6, but the thing displeased Samuel. Well, yeah, because Samuel was a godly man. When they said, give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. Now watch this. <laughs> and the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people and all that they say unto thee, but they have not rejected thee, the Lord says to Samuel, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. You see, God was their king. And it was all, this, look, this, it's the desire for concentrated power. In Verses, uh, well, okay, if you go to verse 10. And Samuel told all the words of the Lord unto, unto the people that asked him a king. And he said, this will be the manner of the king that shall reign over you. <laughs> okay, you're going to get a king. And this is the kind of king he's going to be. This is God's perfect justice. He will take your sons and appoint them for himself. For his chariots and for his horsemen. And some shall run before his chariots. Oh, he'll have an entourage when he, wherever he goes. And he will appoint him captains over thousands and captains over fifties. And he'll set, he'll become, it'll become a military state. And he will set them to ear his ground and to reap his harvest. Not dad's harvest, his harvest. And to make his instruments of one and instruments of his chariots. They're not fixing dad's chariots. And he'll take your daughters. Oh, I'm out of time. When we come back on Thursday, I'm going to continue, continue reading from this text. Look, this is what we're facing. This is why what's happening is happening. And we need to understand it so we can deal with it appropriately. And may I say, we want to deal with it as Christians. But look, my time's up. I do have to go. Hey, don't forget to come to the Harvest Supper at Clayville that I've been inviting you to. But I'm out to even time to even talk about that. I'll talk about it Thursday. This is Jim Gallagher <laughs> reminding you in the words. 
of our blessed Lord and Savior. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free.